So I've really been looking forward to talking about this amazing individual for quite some time. Actually, since the fall of 2020, when I first came across his name, when I was in the middle of an internship with the Denver Public Library. And when I finally learned about this person, I just went through this rabbit hole of pieces of information here and there, just kind of piecing it all together because there's not enough information about this person. That's not to say that there isn't a good amount between old news articles articles and few documentaries that have started to pop up over the past few years because the media has started to become a bit interested in him so he has begun to resurface but I mean me personally I feel like there should be a movie about this man's life but anyway enough of the suspense this person that I'm talking about his name is Ed Dwight and he was supposed to be the first black astronaut but due to racism because this was a period where the United States was segregated and racism was that girl that leads me into, I guess, a disclaimer, kind of a warning. Some of the information I'm gonna talk about while discussing his life might be a bit sensitive for some people, which is why I'm doing this disclaimer warning. And this includes some of the video footage images from his life when all of this stuff was going down that may use language that's offensive and harmful that was very prevalent during this period that I'm about to discuss. So I don't like to sugarcoat anything, including the harsh realities of racism and all the horrible things that human beings have done to one another. And finally, I wanna sum this all up just to make it very clear because I don't want to use any words that can come across outside of what I'm trying to convey so I actually wrote this down as far as the reason why I feel like it's important to include these videos and images that depict exactly what Ed Dwight went through during this period in history and in his life so I'm going to read it you will likely hear some antiquated and ignorant language portrayed in some of the images and video clips that I'm going to share and much of this language was commonly used to describe the black diaspora during this period sharing stories like Ed Dwight's life is an important part of preserving the legacies of men and women who have contributed to the cultural identities of underrepresented people. So if this isn't something for you, now is the time to click off of this video. I just wanted to make that clear because I don't want to offend, well I mean it, it's impossible to avoid offending people. <sighs> hence the whole point of this intro, but I will do my best <laughs> without trying to stray away from the realities of what happened in Ed Dwight's life because I'm not gonna do that. Anyway, now that we finally have that out of the way, I wanna start at the very beginning of Ed's life, so we're gonna go way back. Ed Dwight, full name Edward Joseph Dwight Jr., was born on September 9th, 1933 in Kansas City, Kansas. His parents were Georgia Baker Dwight and Ed Dwight Sr., and his father played second base and center field for the Kansas City Monarchs baseball team and other Negro League teams. This is what all African American baseball teams were referred to during this period. I couldn't find anything as to what Ed's mother did. I'm not sure if she was a stay-at-home mother or if she worked outside of the home at any point but if she was a stay-at-home mom I would not be surprised because Ed was one of five siblings and he was actually the only boy out of the bunch so she probably had her hands full. Growing up Ed and his siblings they were raised Catholic and qualities like virtue, hard work, and honesty were highly valued by his parents when he was growing up. At six years old he was an altar boy and he served at mass every day when he was in elementary school and when Ed wasn't in church he could be found fishing for crawdads, working on the family farm, and playing with orange crates to build toy airplanes. And in addition to that, Ed really enjoyed building sculptures out of random things he would find around the farm. And this would end up having an effect on Ed because he decided at a young age that he wanted to grow up to become an artist. He wanted to be a sculptor. But his father was like, no. Nah. Now we're not doing that starving artist business up in here. We're going to make some money. So you're going to go to school for engineering. At just 12 years old, Ed got his first job as a paper boy where he worked a daily and weekly paper route. And at just 13, he saved enough money to buy his first car. I wish I was like 22, 23. I had just finished college and it was like a $800 clunker that I got from the auction. 
and it was like a 1994 Volvo. Anyway, girl, I wish I had a girl at 13. And the car that he got was a 1929 Model A Ford. And with a Kansas permit, he was actually allowed to drive during the daytime. That's crazy to me. Like they used to let children drive that young back then or or is it like a country thing? Is it depending on what state you're in because I've heard before that kids who work on farms can get driver's license or something to drive tractors on the farm or something like that. I don't know. Don't quote me. I'm sure the information is out there. When little Ed was 14 years old, he started working at his father's ice cream shop and Ed would actually retain this job up until the day he enlisted in the Air Force at 20 years old. And that wasn't the only job that Ed had at this point in his life as a youth. He was a hustler. He had a lot of different side hustles, little jobs he did to make ends meet. That's my kind of guy. I love a hustler. I love somebody who's about making them ends meet and doing multiple jobs. That's that's the type of person I am. Growing up, Ed's home was only a mile from the Kansas City Fairfax Airport. So as a child, he got the opportunity to watch planes fly over his home all the time, especially when World War II started and the airport was converted into an Army Air Force base. So when the war ended Ed and his friends would run down to the airport beg the pilots to let them up in their planes and they would do little random odds and ends and cleaning up things and handing them tools in hopes of working their way into getting in a plane and eventually one day it actually worked Ed was invited up into one of the pilots planes and it was a life-changing experience for him to say the least this was the first time he finally got to see the world from the perspective of a pilot and this being his first time in a plane of course he was very terrified I would have been terrified but he was also very excited because he just saw the world in a different way for the first time in his life instead of looking up he was looking down in his youth Ed met his first wife Sue Lillian James in high school the two would marry in April of 1955 and they would go on to have two beautiful children together a girl named Tina Cherie and a boy named Edward Joseph III and as a teen Ed attended Bishop Ward High School which was a private Roman Catholic school in the area and at this school young Ed really excelled he was a member of the National Honor Society and he would actually be the first African-American to graduate from this school. Ed also won a scholarship to attend the Kansas City Art Institute but he ended up attending Kansas City Junior College today known as Metropolitan Community College and while attending this school he graduated with an associate's degree in engineering in 1953. After earning his associate's degree, Ed enlisted in the United States Air Force at Lackland Air Force Base right outside of San Antonio, Texas. And this was where Ed completed his airmen's and cadet pre-flight training. Ed made the leap to enlist in the Air Force when he one day saw a newspaper and in it he saw an African-American pilot who was standing on the wing of a jet. And this was just life-changing for him because this was during a period where there was zero representation for the black community. I mean, there was none. I, it's still an issue today, of course, but it was just unheard of back then. And so when Ed saw this, it literally changed the course of his life. It showed him that he could do it. But anyway, this is a perfect example as to why representation matters. And this is partially what compelled me to make a video on Ed because representation still matters today in the 21st century. So after Ed completed his primary flight training, he was then assigned to Williams Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona, but not before becoming a second lieutenant with the Air Force in 1955. While Ed was in the Air Force, he really, really excelled. He made captain rank, and he spent two and a half years as a jet instructor at Williams Air Force Base, and he spent around the same amount of time as a B-57 bomber pilot in Japan. He had around 2,500 hours of military flying time at this point in his career. And it was during this time in his career that Ed started attending night classes at Arizona State University. And this was to obtain his bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering, which I couldn't even begin to consider what that entails learning. No ma'am. Ed would graduate cum laude in 1957 at 24 years old. In 1961, while Ed was still serving as a bomber pilot at Travis Air Force Base, he was asked if he was interested in going to the U.S. Air Force Aerospace Research Pilot School, which I call ARPS. I don't know if that's what they call it, but that's a very long 
string of words, so I'm just gonna call it ARPS. And this was located at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And this program would put him in the test pilot program that would put him on the path of becoming the first black astronaut. So when Ed received this letter, this, this invitation, he immediately took it to his supervisor and he was like, what, what do you think, man? What do you, what do you think of this? Should I do it? Immediately his supervisor was like, bruh, they are gonna chew you up and spit you out. They are gonna make your life a living hell. Don't touch it, don't mess with it, don't get involved, stay the hell away from it. But Ed's curiosity got the best of him and he was like, I wanna do it, I, I'm, a, I'm gonna do this. So secretly Ed responded and he was accepted into the program and within just a matter of a few days, he was assigned to Edwards Air Force Base. Now, while all of this was going on and Ed was just living his best life, the space race was going down. And if you're not familiar with the space race, it's a part of the Cold War, pretty much where, I mean, essentially it was a big contest between the Soviet Union and the US. That's technically what it boils down to. And it was exactly what it sounds like. It was a race to space because at this time, Neil Armstrong hadn't stepped a foot on the moon and Russia had not sent the first man into space. So they were racing to be the first nation to make it into space. The origins of the space race was actually a ballistic missiles based nuclear arms race, but then eventually it morphed into this race to space. So the president at the time of the space race was John F. Kennedy. And so the Kennedy administration's focus was on, of course, the space race, so they were interested in space stuff. The other part of their interest was in desegregation. And so the idea, the concept of a black astronaut was born. Let's just combine the two agendas and we created this love child. And I say this to say that extending this offer to Ed or the intent in general to have a black astronaut wasn't purely for the benefit of the black community. Anyone would be crazy to think that. It was of course politically motivated. And yes, at the same time, this move would not garner JFK or his administration any type of sympathy or um or favor from people who were racist as hell back then which were a lot but it also made the u.s look better because other nations were looking at them like y'all still got black folks drinking from different water fountains like what what we don't do that over here we keep our racism on the low but seriously though it was a tactic to make the u.s look better but it also had a side effect of creating another image of what a black person could aspire to it represented to young black girls and boys what they could hopefully one day aspire to become because at this time there weren't any black folks that were in stem based positions back then it wasn't known as stem but that was you know out there in, in the open you know you didn't really see any black folks that were in stem based professions that young black girls and boys could look up to and aspire to be so really Ed would be the personification of an integrated US eventually and an integrated NASA and also black folks can do it too you know what I'm saying there were many levels to this initiative that were equally beneficial to the government and to Ed and to the black community. I say all that just to say that Ed wasn't the only one benefiting from this relationship. The US government was too, the Kennedy administration was too. So this program at Edwards Air Force Base was the US's first formal astronaut training program. I'm talking about thermodynamics, bioastronautics and Newtonian mechanics these are all things that these astronauts in training had to learn in the classroom because the program wasn't just about physical endurance and activity and flying and all that stuff but it was also about learning in the classroom because in order to understand what was going on in a ship 
a plane, you have to have an understanding of some level of mathematics and physics and all that good stuff. I don't know what I'm talking about to be truthful, but you get the idea. The star of the program was the T-27 space flight simulator, where sounds, sights, and sensations were replicated in this simulation to mimic what they would experience in space flight. There was also centrifuge training, which is a test for pilots and astronauts where they test their reaction and tolerance to high levels of acceleration. And this is also known as G-training. The purpose of it is to prevent astronauts in training from literally having blood leave their brain when they go off into space and pass out and this is a side effect of experiencing high gravitational force seven halves the next one and fight time going up on top breathe drop those shoulders push out those abs breathe get your butt nice and tight for me breathe there you go bring those knees in push those lights back out breathe all i know is i could not be an astronaut i am a sci-fi buff so i have some very vague superficial level of what it entails to be an astronaut some of which might not be true so i decided to dive deeper into what it takes the type of training that they go through to prepare themselves for this type of experience while i was conducting research for this video and holy hell no ma'am if you are not appropriately protected strapped up or whatever when you are going into space this is what can happen to you you can experience cellular mutation and or destruction of those cells you can experience radiation exposure nausea and not knowing where your limbs are you just forgot and to keep them from experiencing nausea and all these other symptoms or side effects, they put astronauts in what they call vomit comets, which is exactly what it sounds like, where they would fly for short periods in a way that literally replicates weightlessness. And they accomplish this by having the plane and the people fall at the same rate and then throw up. This doesn't cover the whole program, but it gives you kind of an idea, a sense of how rigorous it was and what Ed went through and his peers went through while training. Now the program of course has changed quite a bit since Ed's time so some of the stuff I'm talking about might not necessarily have existed during that period but one of the things I know for a fact did exist was the centrifuge training or however it's pronounced. That did exist and I remember watching a video of Ed where he was talking about how much he loved it. Yeah he loved it. He said a lot of his peers couldn't handle it. A lot of men it just broke them really but for him he it was like vacation Just breathe get your butt nice and tight for me breathe there you go bring those knees yeah this air force base edwards air force base was the place where experimental and unconventional methods and piloting took place so this was where many tests and inventions were created that led to the u.s making it into space so while ed was in the program he went through a lot. I cannot begin to wrap my head around the amount of racism this man had to face on a daily basis on top of all the other pressures and other bullshit he had to deal with. Because he had the support of the Kennedy administration, he was also frequently referred to as Kennedy boy. And note the boy part in particular. This is a grown ass man we're talking about at this point. He's in his 20s and they're calling him Kennedy boy because calling a grown ass black man boy during this time was a very popular way to dehumanize and demasculinize black men during this period. And Ed was referred to as Kennedy boy or just boy quite a bit, especially by this guy named Chuck Yeager. Chuck Yeager was the head of the test pilot school and the new astronaut program when Ed entered into the program. And initially Chuck was actually one of Ed's heroes and for a good reason, because Chuck was the first person to fly faster than the speed of sound at just 24 years old. And just to give you context, because I I had no idea how fast you had to go to break the sound barrier so I looked it up and apparently he went up to 660 miles per hour to accomplish this amazing feat and in fact they said it was a suicide mission but Chuck he did it he found a way and he accomplished it
With all four rockets firing, Jaeger climbs to 56,000 feet in less than two minutes. So this, including a bunch of military exploits he did, because that wasn't the only great thing that Chuck Yeager did, this eventually led him to becoming an, an American hero. He's still known as an American hero today. And actually, he just recently died in December of last year, 2020. But, and that's a big old but, all of this made it even more disappointing for Ed when he met Chuck. Per Ed, Chuck was determined to drive him out of the program. He saw Ed as a threat to his idea of pretty much what the natural order of things was, which was essentially an all-white NASA. So one day, Chuck called in all the instructors from the program in on a meeting when he learned that Ed was coming into town. And during that meeting, he advised them that the Kennedy administration was trying to shove, and I quote, the N-word down their throats. Furthermore, that the Kennedy administration was using Ed to make NASA black. He then instructed them to act as if Ed didn't exist. Don't invite him to any cookouts. Don't go out for drinks with him. Don't socialize with him in any sense of the word. Act like he doesn't exist. And I'll give him six months and he'll be out of here. And essentially, this is psychological warfare. I looked it up after I thought about it, just to be sure. And yes, that is the definition of psychological warfare. But to Chuck's dismay, Ed did not quit after six months because Ed was not gonna give up. Ed had the weight of the world on his shoulders in addition to a bunch of other stuff. Now, all of this comes from Ed himself in several interviews. And whenever Chuck has been approached about it, he denies all of these accusations. He says that he never, not once referred to Ed as a boy and he never tried to run him out of the program or advised instructors to use psychological warfare against Ed to drive him out. He never acted in any racist manner towards Ed per him. So there are a lot of pseudo expert history edge lords, as I like to call them, that I've seen in comment sections during my research whenever I came across any articles or videos on Ed. These people like to debate over whether or not Ed was good enough, like his test scores, his capabilities as a pilot and whatnot, to become an astronaut. Here's my stance on this. Most of the people who were alive during this period in Ed's life are dead. And I have yet to be able to find any documentation confirming Ed's grades or documented instructor feedback from the program. I think it's also important to mention again, because I already say this in the video, Ed had to deal with a lot more stressful factors due to the Kennedy administration having their hooks in him compared to his white peers. So whether or not Ed wasn't selected due to not being good enough or it having nothing to do with his race, those challenges should not be glossed over. And in addition to this, I've also seen people from time to time, and no shade, but usually they're older white men, and they argue that Chuck wasn't a racist. For the people in the back, I am not calling Chuck a racist. Everything I include in this video is from the mouth of Ed Dwight. So if you want to debate this, go debate it with Mr. Dwight. Although I'm pretty sure this man has better things to do with his time than argue with a bunch of history edgelords. So take this information as you will, agree, disagree, that's your business. And you know what, coupled with the time period this took place in, with the fact that NASA was indeed racist, I mean, look at the people that they had at NASA at this time astronauts were purely made up of white men who were Protestant and that was why the Kennedy administration was trying to bring in someone not necessarily Ed at that at the beginning but someone who was of color who was specifically black to break this up because it was embarrassing to have nothing but white Protestant men make up NASA, specifically the astronauts. I feel like it would be nuts for Ed to just make those claims up. I just, I really do. Why would you even want to deal with that if it had no credibility to it? And you'll have a better understanding as to what I mean by that as we get further into this video, because what he went through towards the end of all this was just horrible. Chuck denied up until the day he died that he acted this way towards Ed in any shape or form. But what he did say when he was asked about Ed was that 
His issue with Ed was that he felt like he wasn't up to snuff to be in the program and that he was only there because the Kennedy administration and that he also received preferential treatment from the instructors. Let me get this straight. Don't, don't talk to him, but we're going to end up giving him preferential treatment. Like that's just two t so different ends of the spectrum that I'm like, there's a lie in there that that just doesn't add up. Like somebody is lying and I don't think it's Ed. And on top of that, Ed had to go through this rigorous program that was one part physical endurance, one part studies that his white peers had to go through as well. But on top of that, this man had the pressure of a lot of young folks and other people who looked up to him. He got 1,500 letters a day. He had to give a bunch of speeches all over the place for young boys and girls. And this was important work. Again, representation. And he also had to deal with untold amounts of racism. That's a lot to deal with. And his peers only had to deal with what they were expected to, which was, get your butt nice and tight for me. And then on top of that, word was starting to get out because of course the White House really, really wanted people to know that we we're about to have a black astronaut on our hands. So he was also dealing with the press. That's a lot to go through and then still manage to stay on top of things. And because of all the stuff that was going on, it also affected his family, his home life, because eventually he and his wife became estranged. But luckily for Ed, he had a lot of support from his his mama. His mama was 100% his cheerleader in his corner. Every day he was reminded by her that he was amazing. And actually, while I was doing research, I came across an article that talked about how Ed's mother got involved when he was younger to make sure he ended up being able to attend the high school that she wanted him to go to. Remember when I mentioned that he went to a Catholic high school called Bishop Ward and that Ed would be the first African-American to graduate from the school? Well, that was because before he attended the school, it was segregated. It was all white. His mother really wanted him to attend the school because it was Catholic and they were a Catholic family and it was the only Catholic school within quite a distance but they wouldn't let Ed in because he was black and his mama was like no no we're not having that and so what she did let me tell you what she did she wrote a letter to the Vatican it's like look my son is Catholic we all Catholic over here and he's been an altar boy since he was six um this is the only Catholic school in our area Y'all need to do something about this. And the Vatican got it desegregated. Yes, ma'am. She got a Catholic high school desegregated. And that is just amazing. It's like these little stories like this that you don't hear about that are just so impactful because it shows you that one person really can make a difference. Like when people say that, sometimes I'm like, whatever, but it is true. I, it might be rare, you know, but if there's a chance, it's worth it. Your voice can have so much power behind it. One letter changed the lives of a bunch of boys and girls living in this area. Now they had an opportunity to attend a totally different school because of one person who wrote a letter to the Vatican. But anyway, Ed's mother was an amazing woman who really loved her son. So Ed successfully completed the Aerospace Research Pilot School program, and to Chuck's dismay, he had to pass him. It was also at this point that Ed was convinced he was pretty much in, that he was officially going to become the first black astronaut. He was really feeling himself at this point and rightfully so. He was doing great. He finished the program. He was on the cover of a bunch of magazines. He was on the cover of Jet. I mean, he was just a rock star in his own right, really. So when he finished the first phase of the program, he proceeded to the second phase. This phase of it pretty much puts you in route to becoming an astronaut for NASA. And he was confident that he was gonna be selected. And I forgot to mention, of course, he also has a president in his corner. So that means a lot. And what Ed was hoping to be selected for was NASA's astronaut group three. This was essentially the next group of astronauts that would be selected. So a conference was held in October of 1963 in Houston to announce who the selected astronauts were. And this was a big deal. You had the press there, cameras were going off, reporters were there asking questions. It was huge. Out of 271 applicants, only 14 would be selected. And of the 14 men selected, Ed wasn't one of them. He was not 
not selected for group three. And Ed hadn't given up hope just yet because he had hoped that he would still be selected, but just for the next group of astronauts. And of course, when they marched these 14 people out, these astronauts, and the reporters and the press didn't see Ed, they were a little confused because at this point, the White House was like, it's a sealed deal. And everybody thought it essentially really was. And so when the group of selected astronauts walked out at the conference, the group of reporters and people from the press were completely confused. And actually, there's video footage of this happening where one of the reporters asked the director of NASA's astronaut office, whose name was Decky Slayton, which is a very strange name. I don't know if it's Dicky or Decky. Decky. You are so dumb. You are really dumb, for real. We're gonna call him Decky. But a reporter asked Decky Slayton, hey, where's Ed? And this guy acts like he has no idea who this reporter is talking about. Was there a Negro boy in the last 30 or so that you brought here for consideration? Uh, no, there was not. But anyway, like I said, Ed was still hopeful that he would be selected for the next group of astronauts. However, that was up until the day that President Kennedy was assassinated on November 22nd, 1963. That was the day that Ed's life completely changed because at that moment, he knew that was it. That support that he had behind him, that momentum was completely gone. And so in 1966, Ed left the Air Force and he never looked back. After Ed left the Air Force behind, he went down many different career paths. At one point, he worked for IBM. And while he was working there, he was making really good money. He was very successful. And at one point, they wanted to offer him a position as the vice president. They wanted him to become the first black vice president of IBM, but Ed was done with being the first black this, the first black that. And after that, he decided to pursue a lot of different business ventures. At one point, he owned a construction company. At another point, he owned a chain of restaurants. He also owned an aviation center at the Denver airport. And then eventually he owned an interior decorating company. And it was during this time where he owned the interior decorating firm that he really started to focus back on the art that he enjoyed making so much as a kid growing up on the farm in Kansas. And so he was really able to explore his artistic side a bit more. And while doing interior design, he connected with Colorado's first black lieutenant governor, George Brown. And over time, he and George became really close friends and one day George approached Ed and he asked him hey would you be willing to create an African-American memorial for the front of the Denver Capitol building and Ed was like no no sir I don't want to get involved with that kind of stuff I don't want anything to do with that but George wouldn't take no for an answer I mean he really believed in Ed and his capabilities. And he told Ed that one day you are going to become the most famous African-American artist the US has ever seen. And when he was encouraging Ed to pursue this path, he asked him how many sculptures or memorials have you seen around this country that are made by or for African-Americans? Today, it's a different story. There are many, especially because of Ed Dwight now. But back then, there wasn't really anything. And so what Ed did was he took his advice. He jumped on his plane and he flew all around the country and he took over 4,000 photographs of every piece of art, sculpture, memorial that he came across. And when he looked over those photographs and he realized that not one was made by or for African-Americans and he was pissed, he was angry, and he wanted to do something about this. So he started going to the Denver Public Library and he would read books on sculpture and uh, foundries. And then eventually Ed would go back to school and earn his master's in fine art from the University of Denver in 1977. And then after that, he would open his own studio and foundry in Denver. Today, this legend has sculpted over 129 memorials and over 18, thousand gallery pieces. He also sculpted the Obamas, Harriet Tubman, Mary McLeod Bethune, and countless other historic African-American figures. I mean, look at this guy's work. He is so talented. And you can find his monuments all over the United States and in areas overseas. Today, Ed is 87 years old and he is still sculpting, which is just 
amazing. I want some of that fountain of youth when I get older. I want some of whatever he's having. You know what's really crazy is that it wouldn't be until 14 years after Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon that an African American would go into space. Yeah. And Ed is one of many African Americans whose voices have been silenced due to racism and ego and just sheer ignorance. But what's so interesting to me about Ed's life is that his greatness, it still came out. It still came to the surface just in a different form. And it's my hope that you enjoyed me sharing his story and that you tell other people about his story. I feel like more people need to know about him. And I really hope that a movie is one day made about his life before he dies. And it's funny because from the interviews that I've read and, and watched, he Ed doesn't really like to be referred to as an actual astronaut because he never made it into space. And he also acknowledges what astronauts who have gone into space have done. And he doesn't want to take away from that. But, but in my eyes, he still deserves recognition. So anyway, that concludes this video. I really hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed learning about Ed Dwight. My next video, I'll be wrapping up the life of Henry VIII. I don't know what the hell made me do an eight part series starting out on this channel. But just so y'all know, if you're one of the few people who regularly watch my channel, I will not be doing the one, two, three part series format. Going forward, all of my videos will be like this, where it's one video, unless there's some weird circumstance where it requires me to make a two parter, which is going to be rare. <laughs> but going forward, all of my videos are going to be in this here format, because as much as I love talking about Henry VIII, I can't do it for eight, nine videos straight again on any subject or any person. So this here is the format going forward. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Perfect.